Heals welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heals is the largest non governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heals was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives, and advocates from around the world to meet, network, and forge new scientific collaborations. So next up, uh, panel session. So um, we have four panelists. Um, so Edward, I understand that Robert wrote works in yeah, place. So the subject of the panel is whether aging is or is not a disease. So I thought before we uh, start, maybe it would be good to have a show of hands. How many of you here think that aging is not a disease? <laughs> thought that might be the case. Um, <laughs> don't be shy. Okay, how many of you think that aging is a disease? Okay, how many people didn't listen to the question? <laughs> how many people didn't put their hand up? Okay, um, does one of, one of you who didn't put who, your hand up, to, what, what, what's going on there? Is, is it that it's too ill-defined or what, what's your point of view? Who, who wants to just shout? I think uh, to me it's too difficult to, to judge what it is and okay. not. Okay, mm -hmm. too difficult to judge. Well, I think there is a continuum. Okay. We should be trying to cure aging, but that doesn't mean we should need to define aging as a disease. Okay, but neither are you necessarily saying that it's not a disease. It's clearly something we need to address. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. We'll, we'll go to a a discussion later. That seems setting. Um, I think David touched on maybe the crucial issue. Ultimately, I would suggest it's a semantic issue. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. It depends how you define it. But should we be defining, do we need to define aging as a disease in order to get the kind of public so support, social prioritization that we need in order to defeat it. So with that question in mind, let's start with you, Robin. Um, it depends what we want to achieve. I think like Daryl will have more of an opinion in the sense of what they would actually achieve defining it. I, I do agree to some extent with David that it, while it's definitely an issue that needs to be addressed, that it is quite difficult to persuade people that it is a disease in a sense because it's not sort of, um, I think it's more of a collection of different pathologies that go on and we don't really understand enough completely yet to persuade people that it is sort of a disease in a classical sense. Um, so in that way, I think it is a problem of semantics a bit. Um, so it kind of depends what you define it. But in terms of uh, whether that would help us attract more research so that that can be funded specifically to attack, I think that's a good idea. Um, I don't know whether it would be better to do that as aging as a singular term or if we can do it in a sort of slightly more sly way that doesn't get people um, as resistant. So uh, classify all of their pathologies or under an umbrella but not actually specifically have it just as aging. Um, or uh, I think earlier... Uh, Claudia was talking about um, having like an accelerated aging thing and then defining it as that, and then we could start tackling it. But uh, it's a difficult issue. Um, I think it's really just an opinion whether it's a disease in the end, so it depends whether it's useful. Um, so maybe I should pass that on to so, you. So we need to be sly. Possibly, because I think some people will be resistant if you say it's a disease, they're like, oh, that's rubbish, but... Um, I, I do agree, I think it is, but it's, it's not in, in the sense that other things are. So I, I don't know if defining it in that simple way is necessarily helpful. And I think that gets people's kind of back up a bit. Whereas it, it might be better to kind of say, oh, well, this is and this is. And they're like, oh, yeah, I don't like that. And then 
all of those things build together a picture of aging um okay. so it ends up with the same end goal but maybe they'll accept that faster i don't know Okay, as a research fellow of, of Institute for Medical Prevention, I was involved into developing a document called Order for Medical Help to Quit Smoking, something like that. And when we were developing it, uh, we, we spoke to the legal department of the Ministry of Health, and they uh, told us to name this tobacco dependence exactly like it was uh, written in ICD-10, because there is a decree from 1997, which says that Russia works in accordance to ICD-10. And we would not be able to sh name this uh, smoke independence in any other way. And uh, from this, I assume that it, in, in countries which have this kind of legal settlement, se se it would be very hard to register uh, drugs, therapies, even to provide clinical guidelines for something which is not uh, in ICD-10. And in this case, yes, we need uh, it, uh, to make sure that there, are, there is investment into this uh, area, and not just aging, also parts of aging, to give more, um, more uh, freedom uh, for drug developers, therapy developers to go on and invest. But do, do we need to classify aging as a disease, or would it be enough or resources to go into the diseases that we associate with aging? Uh, the, the broader the better, uh, because it's uh, each time uh, you have to register a certain drug for another, another condition. You have to go start with clinical trials, perhaps maybe except for phase two, in the event here, I'm not sure, again. I actually, perhaps with phase two, phase one also. So, and that's another circle of this very expensive process. Didier. Um, yes, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm positively but quite surprised by the reaction of the, the people. It's good to, to ask because, of course, if you ask this to a general public, uh, it will be almost uh, uh, the other way around. Uh, so most people will say it's not a disease. Um, so a few words only about the social aspect. Uh, the central point is when somebody is saying, I want to cure cancer, nobody is going to say, oh, you mean that you want to, be, to kill people with cancer. When you are saying, I want to cure aging, there are always people who will react by thinking, oh, you want to suppress old people, or you are fighting against old people. What's not, of course, not logical, but that's what we have to defeat, let's say. Um, so, but probably things are changing. So you see more and more in the general press article about like uh, Google is going to defeat aging, uh, like uh, is, uh, is aging a disease? Um, but in the article, there is really good um, medical information and you see that yeah, indeed, it is something that, you, that we could cure. Okay, that's one point. Maybe on the other side, um, for me, it's kind of a, still, a, still a mystery. I, I work, I, I try to study aging since uh, 10 years now. Uh, it's still a mystery. Why is it so an universal uh, phenomenon? I, um, so it's for all human beings, that's for sure. It's uh, for all mammals. That's almost for sure. It's probably for all vertebrates, and it's maybe even for all uh, animals with uh, sexual life. So it's, it's kind of strange. Um, but anyway, that's kind of a general introduction about the subject. Anyway, even this being said, um, things are changing in the public opinion. I think it is good, so I think it's time to uh, say it more clearly that, uh, or at least to say more clearly, we can defeat aging and it is a disease or it is a, a combination of diseases. Okay, Victor. Um, yes, I, I consider aging a, a disease and I think uh, uh, the debate also has a lot to do with semantics. Um, 
but it's also about public opinion because uh, if there is no scientific consensus uh, to consider aging and disease, it is also very hard for a researcher to come out, so to speak, as uh, thinking that aging is a disease. It's like a political party. Once you have like 10% of votes, then it's like a, a credible large party and you will see all the people voting more and more for it. So uh, that has been my experience that a lot of people might might think this is a very clever way of uh, uh, addressing the aging problem, but it, you need to have a... It's very hard to, to say something that uh, it's not the norm. So well, one more question. I have another round for the panel, then I open it up to the floor. Uh, maybe starting again with you, Robert. Um, what would you say, let, let's suppose that we were able to convince the wider world, the people outside this room, that aging is and should be regarded as a disease. What do you think would be the main benefits of doing that? And do you see any risks involved in that happening? Uh, I think the main benefit would be that I would hope that it would pull both interest and funding into a focal, a focal point so that it would actually focus on the underlying causes of all of these age-related diseases more effectively and end up preventing them rather than trying to sort of just react to each one. Uh, I think it would be a good a good thing in general. Um, the inter what, was the, what was the second question? Sorry? Risks. Um, I think the risks might be slightly that some people feel like you're kind of ramming the definition down their throat when they don't agree with it. Um, and and some of the some of the uh, pathologies within it are maybe not necessarily linked to others. Or I think I think it's actually quite complicated to. I think at this moment we don't have enough of a picture to to know how interconnected everything is. And it might be that if we focus on specific biomarkers, for example, if you conduct a study, the intervention might not actually affect those biomarkers, but it might still be doing something useful in a rejuvenation sense. So. If we focus on things, to like zoom out too much, then it might actually be counterproductive for fixing specific issues. But I think in general, it would do a majority, it would be a majority good thing, as long as, as it actually got practically things moving, so people start talking about it less and start doing more, okay. and that gets things classified, then I think that's a good, good okay. idea. Sorry. Well, of course, uh, the main potential benefit is uh, investment into this area, uh, and to facilitation of translation from fundamental research into clinical uh, practice. Uh, and uh, the only risk I see, uh, financial risk, is that for those uh, healthcare systems which are based on insurance uh, principle, it's like uh, they calculate uh, each small <laughs> medical service and uh, pay it to their healthcare providers. Uh, Whenever there is uh, ex expansion of new methods introduced, that uh, <laughs> is added. Uh, this is actually why in the US there is there are such a high spending on uh, healthcare, just abnormally high, with the same result as in other Western states. Uh, so I guess in general, governments need to switch to um, another type of uh, health financing system. It's like in the UK when uh, there are GPs who have who are given uh, certain money to distribute in this GP according to clinical practice guidelines and everything, uh, they kind of decide what is covered, of course, under strict rules. So we need more uh, flexible um, systems in general everywhere of financing or reimbursing medical care. Uh, but I guess it's uh, the governments will adopt. Mm -hmm. uh, the point is just if there would be a new aging technology and they will be quickly adopting, uh, quickly evolving, there will be like new and new medical methods introduced which could be beneficial for a big amount of, big percentage of people. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> so on balance, certainly a good thing if we can get aging. Of course, of yeah, course. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, I spoke already about the risk that yeah. people are perceiving, uh, yeah, uh, as uh, fighting old people. 
Um, one of the advantages um, who has not approached until now is when you take a look at the definition of what is a healthy uh, person from the um, World Health Organization, it's clearly not for people who are uh, old because it's a healthy situation where you can, uh, well, uh, where you have really a good and healthy life. Uh, so, um, if we say clearly uh, aging is a disease, so we know also clearly that by fighting uh, aging, we can obtain the situation that uh, the WHO is uh, uh, w wants us to be uh, healthy. Okay. So, yeah, mm, I, I think uh, we all agree, uh, well, at least here. <laughs> Uh, to me, the big benefit to classifying this disease will be that it uh, gets acceptable to treat old people uh, with possibly life-prolonging uh, treatments in a way that is not possible now. We uh, have all heard about the metformin trial in the U.S., but of course there are going to become much more sophisticated uh, uh, medicines uh, even in the near future that we, we could implement and uh, of course repurpose other drugs in order to use them on uh, on elderly and by classifying agency disease you you open the doors to do these uh, things uh, so that's the big benefit i will say so i want to open the, the the discussion up now one question that i have in mind up to you whether you address it or something else but so suppose we were to decide that yes, this is really important. We need aging to be regarded as a disease by the wider community, by the medical community, by governments and so on. How would we make that happen? So in other words, suppose we are all convinced in this room that that needs to happen, but that's not enough. We need to convince the people out there. So how, how do we make that happen? And hopefully there will be a microphone coming around. <laughs> Adam has a microphone. Right. Okay, start up. Um, is aging a disease? I would say it's the wrong way around. Some diseases are aging. So the question is, are all diseases aging? So some of them obviously are, like Alzheimer's and cancer. But um, conceivably, you could take any disease that might have no connection to aging, but that disease, say for example an infection, it will still be, the etiology of it will still be worse in an elderly person. Who else wants to, does, yeah, maybe you can just pass the microphone along. Need one of those well, I have a uh, few things to say. First of all, from a, from a, a scientific point of view, at least what, uh, uh, what I know, uh, the relationship between aging and the disease is a little bit more complicated because uh, aging can uh, cause uh, diseases, but uh, in turn, uh, the diseases can accelerate the aging. Uh, so, um, is a, is a very complicated situation. The second is that suppose uh, that we accept uh, the definition of that uh, aging is a disease, uh, since age, we all the people age, all the people will become patients, uh, and this is a dream for pharma, uh, because uh, everybody should be treated. No. And when, no. at age uh, thirteen, after uh, adolescence, at age twenty, we have to stop aging, or uh, uh, at age uh, forty-five, or at uh, age. Uh, 90, so I think that is, uh, uh, is not a trivial question because uh, uh, I think that we have to take into account a lot of other things. This, the other point that I would like to stress is for, for the general public, as far as I understand, the most important message was that of geroscience, uh, that I had the opportunity to participate at this meeting at NIH. The, for for the, the strong message is that uh, we have to combat all the disease altogether, not one by one. This is very, uh, all people can understand. Uh, if people understand that we can combat 
uh, and we have to make an effort not uh, on single diseases, the money that go to cancer, which is enormous, the money which goes to other diseases can be directed to aging because uh, we are saying that to combat all age-related diseases, they are interconnected, they are much more overlapped than, uh, than we thought, biological and mechanistically speaking. So the real message is not to, uh, to say that uh, aging is a disease. The real message for the general public is that we are now in a situation scientifically sound and robust that suggests that we can make another jump to another uh, 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 type of uh, health organization uh, and uh, change in the research, in the research grant, uh, and so on. So everything can change if you accept that uh, we have to combat the diseases all together and not one by one. Uh, okay, Ed Edward, I see you. I think that there is actually no opposition and maybe I will present something that it seems to me solves everything. So maybe a lot of people will react negatively when we do such. Um, it seems to me that we, if we say we need to combat old aging, all diseases at once, uh, well, one way to do so is actually to define, like uh, David James for the nematodes, uh, to define actually the diseases of aging as uh, Daria was presenting for the possibility of ICD-11, which is everything that turns wrong after some time, maybe it's at the age of 13 uh, year old, and maybe that's what we need to do in order to advance uh, against aging. Uh, if it's uh, atherosclerosis, for example, uh, or maybe it's at the age of uh, 35 or 50 or 70 and uh, at all ages. Uh, and in fact, for existing diseases today, there are um, screening, uh, screening movements that are organized by the governments. And a lot of people have a disease, but whether we diagnose it or not, it's a sort of political choice. Um, and so, yes, we are all aging, and yes, we must all be treated, but not necessarily at every time. And uh, so it seems to me that if we define the different uh, sets of what we need to address uh, in a way that the pharmaceutical industry can, can understand, and if we say to the general public that we, it's in order to uh, attack all diseases at once, all uh, formally expressed di diseases at once, it seems to me we have everything. So are we talking about biomarkers? Uh, no, I think it's uh, like the diseases that were described. So indeed, usually, for example, for hypertension, you define uh, tension, and, uh, and if it's over, it's hypertension. So just like what was described for the presentation of ICD-11, there was a choice to be done of disease, like hypertension. So then it comes with a particular biomarker, which is the, the, the level of, uh, of uh, tension. Um, but there could be lots of other biomarkers, so it okay. doesn't uh, answer us all. It's just okay. to define something. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sven, and then uh, the microphone needs to go around. Uh, go. Can you go okay. Well, Sven first, then we, we can converge. So, um, you know, there is a fantastic book that everyone in the audience should read, and it's called The Biography of Cancer. And in this book, there is a long discussion on exactly how uh, in the United States, because the book is written by an American doctor, um, they fought to have, um, you know, research being done on cancer and to make that research a priority. And it all started with a group of people who had long scientific discussions, but not much funding or not much activism and not much, you know, involvement from the government. And, uh, by a lengthy process, uh, they pushed eventually until uh, Nixon declared cancer to be a, a priority. Um, and to bring that to uh, us here today, I think that recognizing that aging is a disease is one, but just one step in the process of making aging a priority to tackle. So we are going to have to do other things. It's not just, you know, it's not because aging is a disease that suddenly, you know, it's going to be a priority, right? But it's an essential first step in that process. Okay, Thank you. so an essential first step. Oliver, go and then if that microphone can go. Um, I think I just uh, bought something uh, 
I just wanted to add to what's uh, been said by several people already, I think, um, such as um, uh, uh, Dario in her, her speech, or Robert also alluded to it. Um, I think if we're going to say um, we have to acknowledge that aging is a disease, it, we need to perhaps uh, come to a tighter definition of what aging actually is, because um, is it just a large collection of accumulation of different uh, pathologies, and in, in which case uh, can we call that a specific disease? Uh, are there any other um, uh, sort of precedents for a large collection of different um, problems occurring in the body that are deemed to be one disease? I don't know. And perhaps we also need to think about how we're defining disease. Well, yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, whoever's got the mic. Well, what I think is a big problem on this is that we are actually trying to classify aging as being a disease because uh, when speaking to the general public, what I often notice is that people compare diseases uh, by, their, uh, by their symptoms. And since aging doesn't really have any short-term symptoms, it's pretty um, difficult, I think, to, um, to convince the general public that aging should be classified as being such a disease. So what I think would be a better approach is to not focus on the classification of aging itself, but on the definition of diseases, okay. to broaden the definition so it can include not only those diseases which already have symptoms, but also uh, things that should be regarded as being diseases, such as aging, which leads to many more diseases. And if so, if, the, if that definition is, is a lot broader, then I think the general public itself will also have a much easier time recognizing aging as one of the biggest diseases that we have to tackle because they no longer just look at the immediate symptoms. But isn't it actually a question on, on treatment? Say, for example, you, you have uh, influenza and you have a, a runny nose, sore throat, etc. So you, one approach to treat is to, to treat something against, to make your runny nose stop and that your throat doesn't hurt and things like that. That's similar to what's being done with treating all the age-related diseases, dementia, osteoporosis, etc. But actually, if you look at the cause, it's a virus or it's a bacteria. So you actually, the smarter way is actually to tackle the virus or the bacteria. And if you do the same thing with aging, like everyone agrees so that the aging-related diseases are actually bad and need to be tackled. So there's a question, what is the best treatment about it? And this may be the best treatment, maybe to tackle the aging process the same way as you tackle the bacteria or, or the virus or the genes with and gene therapy. So we regard aging not so much as a disease, as a diagnosis, a cause of other diseases, right? Yeah, um, yeah the, the way I see it, um, Aging is, is like two categories of things that are going on. The, the first is it's a bunch of dysregulation of, of gene expression post-reproductive age, which causes all sorts of cascades of things going wrong, uh, feedback loops, and lots of things that are connected and other things that are totally independent <coughs> in that kind of realm. And the other thing are, are accumulation of damage for things that operate on a time scale that is longer than reproduction, such as uh, AGEs, um, if, maybe if we were a species of animal that didn't reproduce until we were 100, our bodies would have evolved systems of dealing with AGEs. I don't know how those long-lived sharks, do they suffer from AGE accumulation? Do they have a successful strategy against it? So it's, so it's an accumulation of two, two different areas, I think, which are causing you know, f f fatal damage. I, don't really, I just don't see the point in trying to define so many different things that are going on as a single thing that we call that we might want to call a disease i don't see any advantage in that okay okay i want to bring it back to the panel so a variety of different points of view from an essential first step to don't really see the point i'll go the other way around victor what, what do you make of that? Um, well to begin with about saying who has aging and who has not I, I, uh, you can s you see at my previous presentation also but un until uh, your early 40s uh, between about 18 and early 40s uh, the mortality rates in the western world are essentially flat they don't go up a lot so you can essentially say that anyone who is under their early 40s 
uh, are basically as healthy, even if you are a little bit more aged also visually and so on at 35 uh, versus 20. You're, you have still have defeated aging as long as we can bring the mortality rate back to that level. So essentially we have defeated aging until everyone, when everyone is below 45 biologically, then comes the definition of course how to define that. But I think we have very clear data based on mortality in that sense to know when to intervene, when is it really lethal and harmful. Well, um, I don't have many things to add. Well, I agree with many things who were said. Maybe one point about what Claudio said. He is, he left now, but um, he said if we consider uh, aging as a disease, there is a big uh, risk that big pharma is going to sell us drugs to continue to live. But on the other side, if we consider uh, aging as a disease, we all know that the best way um, to fight against disease is to have a prevention. And so it's uh, becoming, when you consider aging as a disease, it's becoming um, simpler also to uh, promote, well, drugs or therapies who prevent uh, the disease, as the aging as a disease. And so, uh, yeah. It's uh, better in this, uh, and, and and then uh, yeah, okay. And then I mean, uh, it's not it, it's not going to be uh, certain that it's expensive. In the contrary, you know, prevention is uh, it's cheaper than curing. Daria, yes, that there are quite a few skeptics in the audience as to whether classifying aging as a disease is really going to be helpful. So, how do you convince them? that this is something that really needs to happen? Uh, from practical point of view, uh, it's indeed semantics to call it disease or okay. syndrome, uh, according to Yuri. <laughs> so uh, the difference between disease and syndrome is for disease we know theology, like why this happens, and for syndrome we do not. Uh, and uh, maybe for now we do not know everything about aging, but with time uh, it, we they definitely will be complete information. So, and these um, pathologies which I listed, they are quite interconnected. And uh, inflammation and uh, silicinescence and this uh, decline in oxygen co uh, production, con consumption, uh, yes, uh, processing, yes. Uh, they are also interconnected, and they uh, seem to be like the key. Pro and plus, of course, this sense-related thing, accumulation of harmful stuff. This, uh, perhaps, four things seem to be the key uh, in aging. Uh, and maybe uh, in the future, research will show that these are all just one thing. But for, from a practical point of view, if we want to, to have a legal opportunity uh, to register, prescribe, take these uh, cures, we should try to pursue uh, that goal of calling aging a disease. So it's really about overcoming regulatory obstacles to getting the treatments that people need. Yes, for example, aspirin. Uh, it reduces inflammation. Maybe it does something else. Uh, maybe people know better. But it definitely uh, fights aging a little bit. And it, uh, it, is, it reduces um, morbidity in quite a lot of area, including cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, and so on. Uh, so there are anti-aging supplements or, or drugs already, they, and they need to be reviewed as such. Okay, just be before I come back to you, Robert, what, th those of you who are more skeptical about whether it really makes sense uh, or is ne necessarily going to be helpful. How do you address that point? That if, if we are to overcome regulatory and other obstacles to get the treatments that we need to slow aging, then we really need it to be classified as a disease. Well, what is wrong with that argument? Miriam. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering uh, regarding the point. So, so uh, if everybody would agree that aging is a bad thing, like a bad thing like a runny nose or a headache, then people might actually be willing to invest into doing something against it regardless of the regulation. 
or even try to skew the regulation or, or do some changes to the regulation to be able to do something uh, about against aging. But if people have some resistance for whatever reason uh, uh, about classify about treating aging as a kind of disease, and even if it's formally uh, regulated as a disease, then there will still be the, the question, so if people inherently don't want to do it, if they find some other excuse, excuse why not to start treating it and investing in it. So I think it comes together also with a mindset that you really want to tackle this issue. So let's get real, uh, get away from the theoretical discussions. Let's look at the one case of the TAME, the proposed test of metformin. Why is that not going ahead? Is it because the regulations uh, aren't in favor of it? No, it's because they haven't got enough funding. Nobody said, well, we, we can't do this because the, the regulations don't approve it. So uh, it's my understanding. So. Uh, Talking about changing the regulations doesn't seem to be the key thing here. We just need to convince more people that the, the test could have practical outcomes. So maybe somebody knows more about uh, TAME, the progress, than I do, but that's what I picked up from listening to some discussions on it. Yes, but don't uh, confuse USA with the rest of the world. The, uh, the regulation is completely different. So are there other drug trials that are being held up because of yes. lack of regulations? Well, according, I'm sorry, for taking discussion, according to Alex Jarnkov, who works with Big Pharma, they, this is uh, their main cause. But we could indeed uh, ask him again and ask other pharma representative, or to Dart, uh, no, has a lot of contacts in this area. There's certainly a case for reforming how the regulations work, that's clear. But I'm not sure that actually just changing the definition of uh, aging will, will be the key step. So for example, uh, if we want to do a clinical trial for prevention, you start with non-ill people and you wait. How long? The cost is uh, really enormous. So you're not going to be able. Whereas if you define atherosclerosis with some level as a disease, you start with aged persons, uh, with, with people who have the disease and you try to do something about it, it's very fast. And you do get a lot of money for it. So it's just defining that as a, a step for uh, treatment and for being reimbursed for the pharmaceutical industry. In fact, you, 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 do, uh, you do some cure, but it's prevention. That's because we've defined some keystone. So you cure atherosclerosis, and in fact, you do prevention of aging. So that's the practical point. So all we need there is a definition of a biomarker, which can be measured and then fixed. It doesn't mean that we have to define aging as a disease. No. Yes. Well, just uh, to be sure, U.S. has a regulation that uh, there is FDA and it decides everything. And the FDA can rewrite its rule ev as much as it wants to. There is not even, uh, it's called yeah, indeed regulations, then sometimes they are not even regulations, it's just guidelines. For other countries, like uh, I say in Russia, uh, there is a uh, saying that disease is what considered an ICD. Uh, and uh, you will be just not able to do that uh, as they do it in, in this metformin. So let, let's move off regulation for a moment. Um, <laughs> yeah, Miriam made, made an important point, I think, that even if you change the official classification, if you don't reach the hearts and minds of the public, you're still going to uh, uh, meet resistance. So Robert, how do we reach the hearts and minds of the public? <laughs> um, that's quite a difficult question. <laughs> um, and, and how important is it to do so from your perspective? Well, it's massively important. I, I think that the government doesn't tend to take notice until there are considerable groups of people that are supporting this thing. But in terms of how we, how we get there, uh, I'm not sure that anyone really knows how to do that. Um, I think it's a coordinated approach. We have to have uh, better education. We have to be 
vocal but without seeming like crazy pushy people all the time but we also have to push them without seeming like we are you have to be radical without seeming too radical it's like treading a tightrope that's a little bit difficult when you're ahead of the head of the game um I don't know, but I think the questions that other people are raising also raise the important point about the general way that medicine is conducted is that there does seem that there are many sort of no, a lack of common sense a bit within the regulation and the way things are conducted. Like if we were to discover that medicine in a trial did have wider health effects, the, the GP might not be able to prescribe it because it wasn't under their list of things. And that to me is just absurd. Like we should be far more focused around health. But in terms of persuading people I think it's going to take getting some high profile figures on board um, to legitimize it um, more high profile scientists um, and I think particularly the shifting point will be more when governments specifically get involved and actually develop initiatives around this Okay, v Victor how, how important do you think the whole issue of communication with the public is well uh, to a certain extent it, it depends of course who has the resources uh, I mean, you, you either get the resources by having a large accepting public or you have uh, resources by wealthy people who want to invest their, their efforts. There are different ways of allocating resources. So, uh, but of course there's always a benefit by having many people on, on our side in that sense. And I, I like to po point out that when you are very, very old, you you tend to become more accepting of, of your own situation due to the Stockholm Syndrome, as you call it, and then you might uh, be much less likely to, to vote for radical changes that you don't feel that anyway might benefit you yourself. Didier, you mentioned the Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, yes, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Yes, yes, I mentioned, but I, I was not going to speak about that, no, and I don't see directly the, directly the link, but what I, what I want to say is, if you say uh, aging is a disease, you can also have a, a kind of a sense of urgency. It's a disease, so we have to cure it. That's one of the positive aspects. But of course, I agree with what with uh, with what many people say it's it's not the only point it's not the solution uh, it's a part of the solution is and of course it's a kind of a progressive uh, uh, change that is coming and we were speaking at one moment about regulations and uh, for me it's another uh, category of question how oh, um, like uh, Sven said at the end of uh, of his uh, speech one of the big questions is um, how to convince uh, scientists and uh, people, politicians and so on, that um, there is not only the, how can I say that? Uh, it's, n um, oh, sorry, uh, just let me a second. Uh, what was your last sentence, uh, Sven, um, about the speech? Um, not only uh, sorry. It is time to step away from the old paradigm of the list that, um, uh, you know, first do not harm. Yeah. Do not harm. yeah. So, not only first do not harm, but also do something against aging. And when you say aging is a disease, you are going better in this direction. But how, how do we convince people of that? Yeah, that's the whole that's the whole discussion for me. But saying aging is a disease is a good it's a, is a step in the good direction with okay. all, all other aspects that we know. And okay, one other aspect is the fact that people don't. When you say uh, somebody dies uh, died of cancer, somebody died of cardiovascular disease, and so on, here everybody knows that it is due to age and that it would not happen with age, but most people don't know about it, even uh, medical people very often. Do, do we need people to hate aging in the same way that they hate cancer? May uh, perhaps a good question, but uh, I may uh, tell us about a study with focus group which we did in Moscow. We submitted it in a journal and as it, soon we will publish it publicly. Uh, so there are two foc three focus groups 
or two, two focus groups, and we were just trying to sell to people the idea that aging is a disease. We did uh, quite convincing supplementary materials. Uh, we show showing all this graph, how diseases grow in incidence. Uh, and our hypothesis was that the top message would be that uh, preventing aging is preventing uh, ugly diseases like stroke, uh, cancers, and so on. Uh, so top, uh, that was small, of course, study, but still. Top uh, popular message was that uh, preventing aging will allow people to have longer, healthier, happier life. Second was aging is a disease. <laughs> Seriously, 40% uh, – well, pu public is speaking, but 40% found it convincing. It, it, it's more convincing – it looks like it's more convincing to people than it is to, prof to professionals. Because uh, maybe our materials was very good. And third <laughs> one was the one we liked. Yeah. And there was a lot of also interesting implications from this study, but we need to have more studies like that. Uh, have uh, what it, it's wonderful what Robert did. Uh, just uh, have different study designs. It's like selling something, uh, a product to people. If politicians do it all the time. M companies do it all the time. Uh, we just need to invest a little bit into sociological research. So it's easier to convince people than to convince professionals. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Well, are they already convinced if they uh, see that something are, are happens? That, is it vested interests <coughs> that are uh, at stake here? Is it, no. is it that the professionals are too set in their ways and non-professionals are more flexible in their yeah. thinking? So we need another study. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> By the way, good idea. <laughs> no, but for, for, for me, it's very clear when, when uh, but that's a general question, but where, if uh, you were not thinking about one question before, it's easier to make you change your mind that when right. you know about, okay, you know about, I don't know, you know about 60 years, you know since 60 years that uh, uh, politicians are not honest, for example, okay, or you think so, so it will be very difficult to, to change your mind and you're just uh, young uh, and you arrive and somebody says uh, uh, politicians are honest, it's easier to change mind. I, I guess what I'm wondering is just, how worried we should be about whether aging is going to get classified as a disease, by whom, in what context, on what time scale, how much of an obstacle is this really, or do we do better to focus on other things like no, no. funding, for example? That's one of the aspects. Well, uh, I, I, how much of a source of anxiety is this? Yeah, no, I think I think we all agree that it's one of the aspects, but one of many aspects, uh, yeah, to convince public opinion, to convince scientists uh, to make more research. That's one, one thing. Okay, we work right now with one very good uh, company, which is developing a drug. Uh, it's like rapamycin-based, kind of, but not a formulation. Uh, and they know, they're sure that this is anti-aging, they are completely our allies, but they have to register it for benign uh, prostate hyperplasia. And if they, uh, and only uh, these people with that particular disease will be able to get this uh, treatment from professionals. Although they, they see, they hope at least that it also helps with macular degeneration and maybe with uh, sarcopenia, but uh, that would require another set of clinical trials. Although, good idea, let's maybe organize some studies, sorry, of uh, pharma representatives and, and know this. Mm -hmm. Oliver. Can I just ask you a quick clarification to, to Daria, though, because I, I was looking at the presentation over there, and I, I, mean, I looked at it quite quickly, and might, maybe I misunderstood, but I had the impression that you were trying to add a whole ho host of... Uh, uh, new um, uh, conditions into the classifications that are all related to the aging process rather than just getting them to say there's one thing and we call it aging and this yeah. is a disease. I is that the ultimate goal that, for example, like for your drug that you're talking about, they should be able to list it as combating just something called aging? Uh, it's a good question. Maybe we should have both uh, general yeah. and um, uh, 
uh, and uh, small pieces too. But perhaps if we, if somebody affects inflammation, uh, that could be already good enough. But maybe indeed we should have something like asthenia or just it's a really good question. Senility is a bit too So at the moment you're not hoping that in the ICD-11 it will just say there is a disease called aging? Uh, uh, for that, uh, we need uh, uh, specific conditions if anybody is willing to help so us. So in, in actual fact, you're hoping that they list inflammation and uh, oh, I think, know, we think uh, it should uh, be so forth, uh, various it conditions li that are linked to aging. Mm, for that, we need uh, to classify the criteria, uh, for example, y unique, um, like reproducible uh, system of diagnostic uh, cri criteria, like biomarkers. If we get one, uh, maybe we could, it, but uh, let's join us in research. <laughs> okay, thanks. Miriam. So, yeah, the, the, the question is, um, actually just imagine the, the case that some uh, research lab has found some very promising um, medication treatment against aging and they would need some investment. So I guess at this step if they can already convince that um, the treatment has a good chance that they get investors. So I guess to that step it might be even okay. Then you have the issue like um, as it has been said that you need to register this um, medication for some certain disease to get um, to the market, to get reimbursed and things like that. And pharma is um, quite, um, how to say, cautious about it to take this risk to develop something that might not uh, be um, um, classifiable or, or um, um, to treat some certain disease. But on the other hand, if you actually found this promising compound that actually rejuvenates or um, treats aging, then actually you could classify it um, that it treats many of the aging-related diseases because if aging and aging-related diseases are related, then actually you won't have any problem with the classification. Yes, but each time, give me your one billion dollar for each some disease to test. Three? No, each uh, in, in US, for example, registering a drug is one billion dollar for one uh, nosology condition. So yeah, you have so. as many billion dollars as. <laughs> so, but but if you can prove that at least it it um, works against one aging de related disease and pick out the one you know which is the most profitable. <laughs> then will you be able to use it for other diseases? I mean, if I want to take metformin because I think it extends my life, I can't because it's only covered by a prescription for diabetes or I don't know what. Well, that's a kind of regulatory issue that's related to the reimbursement no, system. No, even it's illegal. It's also illegal to uh, sell it in many countries you know, to other conditions. Uh, not those it was prescribed. Can you get it at least, just metformin? I, I've never tried, but I, I guess this is an, uh, an example of where failure to classify aging in a disease could at least become an impediment, even yeah. if it's not the main one already. Yeah. I think that's also a safety concern. I think uh, there is excessive regulation. If a medication has already been approved safe for human use in something else, I don't think that it has, should have to jump through a million hoops to get to the next thing. Right. It should be able to be fast-tracked for right. use or have an exception status or something. I think that's a separate issue. The safety over regulation is a massive problem as well that is almost separate to that, but it contributes, right. Right. I think. But, but then you end up with, uh, with a question, you know, uh, at which point does this aging start so that you're actually qualified to take um, this medication and uh, which state not like aging is a continuous thing and is not something where you can really pinpoint a, a certain date. So therefore you then need um, biomarkers and, and other things and really need to test, you know, are you qualified to um, get this medication or not? Or 
the other way would actually be like, what's with preventative medicine? Like, I mean, with preventative medicine, you don't have any indication yet because you want to prevent the disease. Well, uh, what is optimistic, uh, there were recently published uh, three works, uh, maybe more, uh, of uh, biomarkers of aging, uh, one of them by Belsky Group on biomarkers of aging and healthy adults from prospective studies, uh, one by Jarvankovsky Group and one by somebody else. <laughs> but anyway, there seem to be finally emerging con consensus, and sometimes uh, findings surprise the researchers themselves, like albumin uh, adds a lot of predictive value. So maybe in just a couple years, we will, we will have good biomarkers, and once they go up, uh, we could already start preventing aging okay. or down. Um, I'm going to do another hand count now, if, and, and then I will give the panel a, a last round of comments. How many of you think that classifying aging as a disease is an important strategic issue in the fight against aging? Important, yes, but not the. Okay. How many think it isn't? Okay. So, there are some skeptics still, though most people seem to think it is. So, two questions I would like you to address, and I'll start with you, Robert. Firstly, which side are you on and why? And secondly, to the extent that it is, how do we make it happen? Um, I, I think I would have to read up a bit more, but I have to say, I think there are more important things for me uh, that would turn the tide so faster. You're more with the skeptics. But I, I do think that it, it is an important step as well. Um, as to how much of a priority it is, I, I can't really say for sure, but I think I think that the getting more investment and support is probably, for me, I suspect, is perhaps a more potent way of getting things moving. Okay. Um, uh, imagine this process as a system. Um, there are a lot of uh, nice uh, preclinical studies. Uh, uh, we hear every day that something new uh, was discovered, but it, it does not go very fast into clinical practice. And the bottleneck is clinical trials. So the, there are only um, two groups of organizations which can do clinical trials, perhaps uh, f uh, biomedical and pharmaceutical industry, and sometimes hospital do it just for research. Uh, how can we convince uh, these uh, uh, two organizations, and especially uh, com commercial companies to do more clinical trials on what we need. Uh, they need to feel safe uh, in legally that this is not a risky venture because biomedical industry ex already is the terribly risky, it's just too many drugs uh, do not p uh, work or are toxic. So we should come to them to these investors and to biomedical companies and ask them, and from what I heard now, well, that would be beneficial. And how do we make it happen? Uh, uh, lobbying, advocacy as usual. Lobbying advocacy. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I don't have a lot to add, but if I understand correctly your, your question, my answer would be, well, the two priorities in this important question, but not the only one, we are that's for sure, would be working in the ICD uh, field. Mm -hmm. So try to change to have, well, uh, with all these sub-questions, but uh, the uh, aging as a disease and uh, diseases related to aging clearly uh, defined. That's one side. And the other big side is uh, working on the public opinion. Okay. To, yeah. Big time. Well, I will just like to add, just like I said before, that I, I think it's uh, a matter of uh, scientists coming out saying that aging is a disease because they also can give pub change public opinions through media and uh, in the academic field. And I think there are a lot of scientists out here right now who are not in this room and who even don't know people in this room, but who still will consider aging a, a disease, but uh, they are not convinced to say it, really. So uh, activating the silent majority of scientists. Yes. Okay. Edward, you want to have the last word. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would just like to say that currently in ICD-10, we have this R54 code, 
If you just Google R54, you can add senility if you want. There is something called senility in the international ICD-10. In the US, it's called age-related physical disability. So if you don't call aging, what is it then? Uh, frailty, no? No, no, no age-related physical no, dis no. debility, no. debility, yeah. yes. And it it's applicable to frailty, old age, senescence, okay. asthenia, etc. And it can be used to indicate a diagnosis for reimbursement purposes. Yes. So it's, it's clearly here, it can be used for by the pharma. The fact is that for it's too general, people. I think. But and that's for, my understanding. The fact is yes. So it doesn't work from a practical point of view, yeah. it's already there. Okay. But okay. also it's for old ages. Maybe David is a skeptical, could also add something, what sure. do you think? A skeptic, David? Okay. okay. <laughs> well, the issue will continue be to be discussed, but uh, a big hand for the panelists. And, and to the moderator. <laughs> yeah.